so much for being here. We have folks who are still getting settled. Before we get started, I want to name, we have a Spanish interpreter here with us tonight. We obviously have an ASL interpreter as well. If you are a Spanish speaker and you would like to, to come move down to this area to be nearer to our interpreter, welcome you to do that at this time. I will hand the microphone to him so that he can say that in Spanish very quickly. Thank you, sir. Si por alguna razón necesitan un intérprete, yo voy a estar sentado aquí, solo que pueden venirse a sentar aquí a mi área, así para que yo les pueda ayudar. Gracias. Thank you. And now, Director Del Phillips. Good evening. It's good to see everybody here this evening. Uh, welcome to Sumner County Schools. If you're not from Sumner County, uh, we appreciate you being here. Part of this uh, really historic uh, conversation that's uh, getting kicked off here in Sumner County. This is the first of eight statewide meetings to talk about uh, the funding formula for uh, the state of Tennessee uh, in public schools. And so we appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you to Commissioner Swin and uh, her group for reaching out and asking if we would be a part of this and host this here uh, in uh, Sumner County. And we were elated to be able to do that. So welcome back to Sumner County. I know you've been here many times, but it's always good to have you uh, in, in Sumner County and in our district. So uh, with that being said, um, welcome. I'm going to turn it back over to Chelsea and she's going to do a few housekeeping chores, I think, and then get us started. Thank you. Thank you so much and appreciate you all being here with us tonight. I want to thank uh, Principal Darren Frank here at Merrill Hyde Magnets High School. Uh, thank you to Director Phillips for having us Sumner County Schools. And thank you to all of you for coming tonight. Really excited to begin our conversation. We will hear from Commissioner Schwinn momentarily. Uh, as I mentioned, we have our interpreters available to you, so please make use of those folks. And just wanted to start kind of announcing and, and recognizing that it has been just a really interesting couple of years. There is a lot of exciting things that are happening in public education all across our state and across the country. But we have a really huge opportunity to talk about an important topic here tonight. The focus of this evening's discussion is the opportunity in front of us, which is developing a student-centered public school funding strategy. We want to respect everyone who came here today. We're gonna to spend the next hour, hour and a half talking and really hearing from many of you in terms of what you would like to see in public education funding in the state of Tennessee in the future. Want to make sure to acknowledge, I know many of you checked in when you got to the meeting. If you did not have an opportunity to do so, I want to make sure that you know. If you look at that QR code right there, that is actually how you can sign up to make a couple of statements to us tonight. Really, as we've said before, we want to hear from the public about this issue. You will hear the commissioner talk just a little bit, but we wanna hear from you about your hopes, dreams, visions for public education funding. So please make sure to sign up. After we hear from the commissioner, I will do a little bit of um, kind of directing to bring folks down to the microphones that you see in either side of your aisles so that you can actually have a couple minutes to say what it is that you would like to say and so that we can have that for the benefit of the conversation to take back to members of the Tennessee General Assembly, other policymakers, and to the, the general public of Tennessee. I also want to mention uh, the Department of Education is very excited to work with you all on this opportunity to discuss the state's funding formula for pu public education. But before we begin, the department would like to remind you of the following. Conversations on this topic are not intended to reflect on the current BEP funding formula. The current BEP funding formula will remain in place until a new funding formula is recommended to and approved by the Tennessee General Assembly. The public is encouraged to submit comments in writing to ensure that all communications are thoroughly documented and can be reviewed and considered in the future. Public comment is encouraged to focus on developing a new funding formula rather than revising the current formula. Consider what should be funded in a new formula and at what level. Subcommittees will be responsible for public comment, reviewing those and making recommendations for what should be included in the new funding formula. While all committees, subcommittees, and members of the public should feel free to communicate openly, documents and records may be subject to public inspection pursuant to the Public uh, Records Act of Tennessee and may be posted publicly or otherwise made available. 
All recommendations that are submitted to committees and subcommittees will be reviewed and considered, but not all recommendations will ultimately be included in the new proposed formula for funding in public education in Tennessee. So I really want to hear from you all about what you would like to see in the future. And at this point in time, I'm gonna welcome Commissioner Schwinn uh, to come to the stage. Commissioner Penny Schwinn will tell us just a little bit about what we are attempting to do here in the state right now, how important it is for you all to have your voice heard as part of this conversation, and paint a little bit of a picture on where we will go from here. So Commissioner, I will turn it over to you. Good evening. Good evening, good evening. It's nice to see you all there um, and here. And so I actually am just so glad that some of the first things that I am seeing um, are the reason why we are here. And those are our students and our future students and what it is that we want to be true for them. So part of this conversation has to do with the fact that we've had this conversation for years and years. One of the first things that I heard when I started this job is that we need to talk about school funding where it goes, how it's spent, what we need for our students so that whatever they want to do after they graduate from high school, they're ready to do and ready to thrive and ready to be successful. So at this point in time, what we are looking to do is to take community feedback, really hear from folks across the state of Tennessee, from our parents and families who know what they want to be true for their students. Our parents are the biggest experts on their own children. To hear from our students, our exceptional student leaders, who have a voice and have a lot of opinions and perspective about what they want to be true in their own experiences right now. To hear from our community leaders, our school district officials, our business leaders about what we have to do in public education to ensure that every single graduate is ready to thrive in the careers of their choice. Part of the process and part of what we will be doing over the next three months is that we will be engaging in town halls like this across the state. We encourage our districts and community organizations to also have town halls and community meetings and submit that feedback. We'll have Twitter town halls. We have an email address that's already open for public comment to be submitted. And certainly um, on a number of school visits and local activities, we will be presenting and having these conversations. Please know that from a process perspective, everything that is shared in these public meetings, every single comment that is submitted to us through writing especially, those will all be filtered up into our subcommittees. Our subcommittee structure is intended to do the following. They get all of this information. They have um, opportunities to network within their own communities. They collect needs and wants, dreams and hopes of our Tennessee families about what they want to be true for public education. They'll have conversations that help them to identify the specific resources and needs that we want to consider within a school uh, public funding formula. And then from there, we'll provide recommendations. Those recommendations will go to the public steering committee that's comprised of those folks who are either on education committees or finance committees in the General Assembly. Uh, those recommendations then may or may not be considered by the General Assembly for, for a new formula. But that is what we want to do. We want to make sure that everyone is heard, whether you can come out here in person, whether you're live streaming, whether you want to submit something on your phone um, while you're at someone's soccer practice, which is what my husband's doing right now, because he cannot come, so he will be sending in his comments, whether you want to make sure that you're a part of a Twitter town hall so it's a more engaging back and forth. We want to try different opportunities for people to meet them where they are at and ensure that every single Tennessean is able to provide feedback in a way that is meaningful for them. This is really about a needs assessment. What do we want to be true for public education in this state? That is a very, very big question. For many of us with kids, I've got two girls in public school right now, I have a lot of hopes and dreams for both of them. I have a lot of things that I want to be true for them, and they are two very different little girls. I call them salt and pepper, because they could not be more opposite. And they might need different things. I can tell you for sure, Abby's gonna need something different. But what I want is for both of them to be successful when they graduate, I want them to be happy, and I want them to feel good about whatever it is they choose to do. This is a really important conversation because it's a conversation about families and it's a conversation about the futures of our children. Let me tell you what this is and what it's not. This is about developing a new formula and having an idea about what that can be from the ground up. This is creation. Sometimes it's hard to come up with new ideas versus talk about something that already exists, but this is about creating a new formula. This is not, and I wanna be very, very clear, this is not about some preconceived formula. We know we wanna to go to a student base, and that means we know how every individual child is funded and what that will mean for them. Outside of that, all of the input and all of the feedback that we are getting over the next three months is to help us figure out what that should look like, to put meat on the bones, to really define 
what a new funding formula can and should and will potentially mean for Tennessee students and families. So what you say, what you contribute, what you submit, it will all be reviewed, it will all be considered, and it all deeply matters. So I really encourage you to get involved. If you want to have community meetings um, with, with your friends and relatives and neighbors, please do that. This cannot be the first and only way that folks engage. This is going to be an ongoing conversation. But know that it is one that matters deeply to the future of our state and the future of our kids. I'm super excited to actually see students here today. Um, I do want to recognize um, a couple of young women that I talked to earlier. If you, if you both wouldn't mind standing, um, just to give us a visual, these are some of our student leaders who will help us to figure out what that formula is going to be. So if we can give them a hand, I think it's amazing. Thank you. And then I, I, I'm not going to call y'all out because I know y'all are doing homework and I'm super excited, but we have some other students who are a little bit younger and not quite ready for those high school responsibilities yet, but we have families here and I know there we have many families in the audiences. So just want to recognize that we've got a lot of students and this is giving us the visual of why we are here. But I really want to reiterate that the point and the purpose of all of these conversations is to ensure that when this is over, what we know to be true for Tennessee students and families in this state is they have access to the best possible education and we have resourced them in a way where all of our students can thrive and be successful. Thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to hear what y'all are gonna say um, and look forward to the conversations ahead. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Commissioner Schwein. We are gonna move into the public comment period of this meeting and very excited that there are more than 60 of you who would like to share your thoughts tonight. So we are very excited to hear about that. I wanna tell you a little bit of how this is gonna work logistically. I'm gonna ask Victoria to come on over here and see if she can grab this other wireless mic from me. We realize that you all are in an auditorium seat and it might be a little difficult to get up and get out to the aisles and so we are actually going to bring a microphone to you. Scott Meltzer is gonna to have the microphone on this side of the aisle and what I am going to do is stand here and actually call your names I will call the name of the person who is next to speak the first one we'll get started here in just a minute her name is Tammy Sharp and then I will fo uh, follow that with the second name of the individual what we will ask you to do when you hear that your name is called please raise your hand so that we can have someone bring a mic over to you Everyone will have about two minutes to speak. We recognize that I think all of us could go on and on about what we would like to see for our children in Tennessee. We wanna be respectful of your time. We also wanna be respectful to the others who would like to have some conversation here tonight. So I'll ask Tammy Sharp to please raise her hand and Robert Taylor to raise his hand. So Tammy is up here. And Tammy, we will go ahead and get started with you. Scott, you can take the mic to Mr. Sharp. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Swin, for having us um, here tonight. Uh, my name is Tammy Sharp. I'm from Rutherford County. We're the fourth largest district in the state. We have uh, 50 schools. We have 50,000 students, uh, really 60 if you count the city school. So what I want to talk about education part of it it's what I call the wraparound services and I'm sorry I can't get it all in in two minutes but uh, English second language students Laverne and Smyrna now has a hundred thousand people in our area just from the numbers from the census I have the largest um, Hispanic and Middle Eastern um, population in the whole county I'm concerned of our students because especially when it comes to testing. Uh, we have a year mem memorial on their uh, testing, but my teachers are telling me that it's taken three to five years for them to fully understand. So that's one issue. The second is our, our nurses. Uh, some we have, you know, they're not fully funded. So we have 50 schools. We have some schools that share nurses, but we absolutely have high schools that have 30 to 40 students a day that they see. They may be figuring insulin for breakfast and lunch. Uh, they have feeding tubes. The general public has no idea the wraparound services that our school system does. And our nurses behind our teachers are the un unsung heroes. And they're, they're who absolutely, absolutely kept our students in school, because we didn't close, uh, kept them in school and kept them safe during the COVID shutdown. So then the next also would be our CDC and SPED. Um, the federal government usually um, funds at about 15%, but about 25, 35 years ago, they said they were gonna fund us at more, I think it was closer to 45%. We've never gotten that. So, and then the last is, we've got 50 schools, 50 buildings. A lot of mine, I've got 14. Uh, a lot of them are older. 
most of the schools were built back in the 60s and the 70s. Our uh, county is sitting on almost $100 million in deferred maintenance. Now, Ezra is going to help a lot of that, but you know, most of our older schools either need a roof or an HVAC, or they need both of them. So there's a lot of things that go into that BEP formula that aren't, that aren't paid for that need to be considered. You know, I talk to our friends at the legislature and they say, the BP is fully funded. I'm like, yes, but how old is it? It's just like our Tennessee unemployment. It's 20 or 30 years old. You're fully funding it. So what you're telling parents is true. But $275 is not enough for unemployment. So we, we have to go back and we have to visit this. And thank you for taking this on. And we're all, we all have so many issues that are in this and, and it's not gonna be one pill to swallow for everything. So that's, that's what I'm thinking right now. And thank you for having us. Good evening, everyone. Now that's too loud. My name is Robert Taylor, and I am a parent and community partner in Davidson County. And I just wanted to talk briefly. I wanted to echo, I believe it was Ms. Sharp that spoke first. I wanted to echo her comments. I think that those are uh, definitely some things that we would want to see in this new uh, system that we're going to use to fund education in Tennessee. Um, I am also glad to see that we have some students here because we talked about it being student focused, but don't necessarily get student input. And we talk about a lot of things and don't actually implement them. And so I wanna make sure that as we say these things that we actually do them. Um, so I wanna address two of the criteria that you have listed on the, uh, on the one pager that you have on the front table. So those two criteria that I wanna talk about today are the uh, criteria that says that we wanna reflect Tennesseans values. Okay, so I'm a Tennessean, and something that I value in education is that we provide equitable education for all of our students, okay? And we look at the resources that they need to be successful in our school, and we make sure that we provide for them on a consistent basis. Not one program coming in and then leaving, and then another program coming in and then leaving, but we're consistent throughout their entire matriculation. All right, and then the other th one that I wanted to address uh, comes from the first one. And so it says, ensures all students, regardless of location and learning needs, are served at a high level. And so if we want to serve them at a high level, it's very difficult to do that when we have some of the lowest funding per student in the country. If we want the outcome of high level education, we need to make sure that we have a high level of funding to go along with that. It's great to say that we were fully funding whatever formula we had before. I wanna make sure that the new system fully funds the actual cost of educating our children at a high level, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Taylor. And I will say we are already off to a great start keeping with the two minutes, so I thank you both. Uh, next up, we will hear from Ms. Lorelei Gould. The next person who will speak is Shawnee Bledsoe. So Shawnee, if you would raise your hand right over here. And Ms. Gould, please go ahead. Yes, thank you for this opportunity. I'm uh, Lorelai Gould, and I'm a retired school counselor and college advisor. So I have a lot at stake, I have a lot of thoughts. But one thing you all know is that schools are expected to be all things for all students, for our community. I understand there's been talk about closing the gap, closing the achievement gap. And that is a very worthy goal. But we must help all children of all abilities and backgrounds advance. We need more than a new model. We need more funding. I agree so much with you, sir. We need more equitable funding. And that means funding to meet the needs of all students. Whether we're talking about urban, suburban, or rural schools, whether we're talking about students with various abilities, and learning styles, students from differing economic circumstances, and English language learners. How do you weigh which is more important? All are important. We need school staff in every type of position who are well-trained and well-compensated. And we need those positions funded. So many positions are not. 
we need funds not to be drained from public schools. Public education is our cornerstone as a democracy, as a society. Please do not pull already limited funds from public schools through vouchers or more charter schools that are sometimes not as accountable. Help low performing schools improve. Please don't take away funding and move away students, but give those schools the resources they need to improve. Funding. Research shows that more school funding means more learning. And isn't that our goal? More learning for all students. It's no secret that Tennessee schools are greatly underfunded when compared to other states and have been for years. And yes, schools may be the single largest expense for the state budget, but it's so worth it. Investment in schools is an investment for all of society, for all of our, for the future of our state. And just to tell you something that a student told me not too many years ago, he was a rather mediocre student in high school when I saw him. Thank you so much, Ms. Gould. It looks like we might have a, a, a microphone issue, but we will get that resolved. We're going to go now to Shawnee Bledsoe. The next person to speak is Sonia Thomas. So, Sonia, if you would raise your hand, we'll have Victoria to come on around with the microphone there. Ms. Bledsoe, please go ahead and get started. Hi, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Shawnee Bledsoe. I'm a parent in Clarksville, Montgomery County School District, and I'm also here with the Freedom Fighting Collective. I want to talk on how we can make the cha this change in student funding successful. Parental involvement and parental consent is at the forefront of educational discussion nationwide. We are here to discuss our state goals of switching gears on how they fund education to a more student-focused model. While I appreciate and applaud the effort and direction the state is taking, if there is going to be any chance this direction can produce successful results, we need uh, the successful results we need. There needs to be a requirement for parental involvement and parent, parents to have a seat at the table. Successful education is like a three-legged stool. Educators, students, and parents are the legs of that stool. And for it to be continue, for it to continue to stand, all three legs must do their part equally. You cannot remove one of those legs and expect the stool to continue to stand. Education has culturally moved farther and farther from family-friendly learning. With that being said, if funding is going to be determined on the student fo on student focus. What better person to advocate for the student in that process than the expert on that student, the parent? My question is this, is the state committed to requiring a family-friendly learning environment first and foremost from each of its school districts in order to make this plan successful? If so, what are the actionable ways that the state is intending to create a requirement for family-friendly learning, uh, family learning culture in the state of Tennessee? A great start would be legislative change to the Sunshine Law requiring truly open public comment at every public school board meeting, as well as a requirement for parental communication. This is the first time in the state of Tennessee that I have truly experienced open public comment, and I've served on a board, and my mother has served on a board for 15 years in the state of Nevada. First time I've experienced it here. Um, and I also attend every public school board meeting in Clarksville, Montgomery County. We've never experienced that there. I also feel we need to require full transparency from our districts in terms of curriculum, policies, and educational resources used to educate our students. I look forward to the opportunity to be a true partner in education with our school districts. Thank you very much for your time. Ms. Bledsoe, thank you so much. Appreciate that. We are moving now. Uh, we will hear from uh, Sonia Thomas, the next person to speak. I'm trying to get this last name right. It is Becky Zientek. Zientek, something similar there. We see her here. Ms. Thomas, please go ahead with your comment. Thank you. And thank you to the person who just mentioned parents. Yes, we need parents to be front and center, not only today, but in the future and when the final decision is made about this formula. But also, we need to make sure I want, to, I want to piggyback off the young lady about transparency. We need to make sure we don't make decisions until we have receipts. Make sure that the new formula is producing outcomes for students and not paychecks and jobs. We need to make sure that our students are reading above grade level, that we set high expectations for them because they are genius. I'm looking around this room and as you can see all of these parents, we represent parents and grandparents from our most struggling community 
who have the children who are in our lowest performing schools. We're talking about losing sleep. We're talking about making decisions about, about our children, making the wrong decision and hoping and praying that you don't cost them their lives. So this formula needs to be directly focused on these babies. And while we're doing that, let's make sure that five years from now, when we have a vision, after we do this formula, we have a vision of what five years from now looks like. And then we come back and we look to see if we made progress. And if we didn't, overhaul it again. But there are many students in, in districts across this country who don't have a lot of time, y'all. We're talking about real lives. So make sure that we take that into account. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ms. Thomas. I appreciate that. Uh, we are moving now to Becky Zintik. I hope I'm not getting that name too wrong. The next person up who will uh, be speaking is Steve Van Kirk. Steve, if you would raise your hand right next door. Very good. We will come to you next, sir. Um, Becky, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Becky Zintek. You were close. Um, so bear with me. I just switched my topic that I'm talking about. Um, I was going to talk about technology in the schools, which I'm very passionate about um, ending. Um, so much technology, but I actually feel after hearing so far today, I want to share with you something. I'm a military family and we have lived a lot of places. We've experienced a lot of school districts and a lot of schools. One thing that I always go back to is West Texas and we actually weren't military at that time. Um, when we lived in West Texas, we had an incredible situation where um, our local school was horrible. It was not performing. Kids were in a very, very bad situation safety wise as well as performance wise. Teachers were not getting proper compensation at all. And what they have in Texas is true school choice. And I know that scares a lot of people, but I am here to tell you it is incredibly beneficial and this is why. So when we realized what the state of that school was that my child was supposed to go to, we also learned about the school choice option, which was open to every single parent. So instead of sending our child to that school that we knew was underperforming, we were able to send our child to the top performing school in Texas. And it was in the smallest town, I swear, in West Texas. The population of the town was 30 people. The school had hundreds because they were able to recruit outside of their town. So literally there was more kids at the school than lived in the town. They have to market to the parents. They have to get the parents to the door to get the money. They have to get the kids in the seat to get the money. So they want to hear from the parents. In fact, they made us sign documents saying we would be actively involved in our children's education because they wanted us there. My child received an incredible education with incredible textbooks, and every school got to pick their education process, what worked for those students in that school, and cater to them. In one year, that school district we chose not to go to received a mass exodus because of their choices. It forced them in one year to change everything because they needed that money. They had to close the school, and they needed to reopen. So the only way they could do that is if they got the kids back in their district. They did, in one year. And the reason that happens is there is accountability. There is true accountability when you as a parent get to choose where your child goes, what education they receive, and furthermore, one of my passions is technology. I do think there are some serious concerns putting technology in these kids' hands when we cannot prevent them from accessing porn and other things. And it is 100% not possible. I promise you, it is not possible. And if I want to, as a parent, choose to send my child to a school that does not mandate a computer where I have to waive his rights of privacy to have, I don't have a choice in this state. I don't have a choice in my district. I had to pull my child and homeschool him, and I did not receive any financial compensation for that because my district chose to exploit my child. And I have no repercussions to that district. In fact, they chose not to educate my child for 60 days, and I had no repercussions to that district. But if the money followed my child, I could take my child to another school and they would be happy to have him there because they would get the money and the funding and they would more than likely want to accommodate my child. Ms. Zintek, thank you so much for your comments. I appreciate you sharing those today. We are going to hear now from uh, Mr. Van Kirk. Uh, next up on the speaking list is Callie Cook. Callie, if you would raise your hand. Oh, right here. Okay, we're all over in the same neck of the woods. Mr. Van Kirk, please go ahead and get started. 
All right, thank you. My name is Steve Van Kirk. Um, I'm from Clarksville, and I'm with the Freedom Fighting Collective. Uh, my wife and I moved to Clarksville a few months ago from Washington State. We didn't really like the way that state was headed, and um, the education curriculum was part of that, actually, part of that decision. Um, I wanted to say thank you that we have an opportunity to speak here. You would not believe what it's like in Clarksville to show up at a meeting and get an opportunity to talk. You actually have to get approval from the school board's attorney before you can speak. So it's important for you to know what goes on in other parts of your state. Um, my wife and I homeschool mainly because of concern that God has been taken out of our schools and all of the, all of the issues that follow, gender confusion, racial issues, all of those sorts of things. Um, so we keep our kids at home. But I do have a concern over the funding topic as it relates to that. Um, what I would really love to see is a situation where the money follows the child for just the reasons Becky was describing. It brings accountability to the situation. If you've got a school that's underperforming or not doing what they should be doing, and parents have the choice to pull their children out and the money follows that child, that's a huge motivator for change, a huge motivator. Yeah, there's some short-term difficulty. I'm not saying it would be easy, but it brings the long-lasting change that you're after. Um, and lastly, I would also propose some sort of, um, I'm treading lightly here, tax credit, stipend, et cetera, for homeschoolers, uh, for those who choose, or, or for those who opt for a private school, but I don't want it to come with a bunch of government overreach where they get to mandate what I have to teach my child in terms of stuff about their Lord and Savior or stuff about their gender or their pronouns or any of that sort of stuff. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Van Kirk. Appreciate those comments. Next, we will hear from Kelly Cook. Our, our next speaker is going to be Emily Masters. Emily, if you would raise your hand. Oh, there you are. I see you. We will run a mic over to you. Kelly, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Kelly Cook. Um, I'm a former school counselor at Clarksville Montgomery County School Systems. I'm a mom of four and also freedom fighting, a member of the Freedom Fighting Collective. Um, we're all right here together and um, our biggest thing is let the money follow the child. You know, I, I hate that we all ended up talking together, but um, just like Becky said, um, you can also, if that interests you, look what Florida's doing. It's called, it's called the HOPE program. Um, they're doing the same thing, and it brings accountability to the schools. How amazing. I mean, raise your hand if you would like to choose where your child was educated. Yeah, I mean, come on. You get to choose where they go to school? That would be amazing. Um, I pulled my first grader from school last year basically because of the increase in technology. Our little children do not need to be on a computer for seven or six hours a day. They do not. We need textbooks. And I pulled my child because of that reason. And when they told me that my child was going back to traditional learning, I cried, okay? I don't want my child looking at a computer screen all day. I and I also want to know exactly what they're learning. And guess what? When they bring that book home, we know what they're learning, okay? And there have been some questionable things in the Tennessee um, schools. Um, brain pop, look into brain pop. There are some things that on brain pop that I know most of us do not want our kids learning, some components of critical race theory. We don't, that, it's supposed to be outlawed in Tennessee, but yet these apps are still containing part of it. So if I'm worried about what my child is learning, why are we funding that? It is time for the money to follow the child. Thank y'all. Ms. Cook, thank you so much for your comments. We are going to hear next from Emily Masters, who is right over there. Our next speaker is going to be Frank Napolitano. Is Frank, Frank is here, too, on that side, so we will come to you with the mic, sir. Uh, Ms. Masters, please go ahead and get started. You might need to try and push the button on the mic. I know we had a... Now? There Great. you go. We heard you. Hi, thank you. My name is Emily Masters, and I serve on the Metro Nashville Public Schools Board of Education. Um, and I am very appreciative of the opportunity for this to speak about the BEP, the change of the BEP funding formula. 
um, the number one thing I would like to contribute is that it is underfunded and we need a lot more money going into our public schools. Um, I would also like to speak to what Mr. Taylor spoke about earlier about equitable distribution of those funds. I think it's very important that the state take a look, a close look at all of the districts and how much funding from the state has actually been serving our students. For example, in Metro National Davidson County, the state only funds about 30% of what we end up then putting into serving every student. Um, I think that our larger districts have historically been grossly underfunded, so I'd like to be sure that that is considered. I'd like you to also consider the districts that are educating some of the children who are more expensive to educate because of the need, going back to the first speaker, of wraparound services. I'd like you to really give some thought and care in considering our English language learners um, because that is a growing population in Tennessee. And I'm very proud as a lifelong Tennessean of the fact that we are such a welcoming environment. And I would like us to be able to serve all students in a way that is respectful of their cultural needs. Um, and then I would like to also just speak to some of the, the concept of the funding following, following the student. Uh, just a reminder that this is about funding public education. It is the right of every citizen to receive a high quality education. We have very highly qualified, highly trained teachers in our public schools. So I just wanna be sure that when we're talking about funding following students, it's following them to public schools where the funds. Thank you so much, Ms. Masters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Thank Masters, you. for your comments. I appreciate that. We are going to hear from Franklin Napolitano. Uh, next up is Marilyn Caperton. Marilyn, would you raise your hand? Maybe it's Mary Lynn. Mary Lynn, okay, we've got you right down here. We will get you a mic. Mr. Napolitano, please go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I had some prepared comments, and I, I've kind of thrown those out the window. So um, I heard you talk about your, your kids, which you referred to as salt and pepper. I also have two kids. I have a boy and a girl. They're twins but they couldn't be more polar opposite. Uh, he's blonde hair, blue eyed. She's brown hair, brown eyed. He's a lefty, she's a righty. He's a, an introvert, she's an extrovert. They learn very differently. They're very different kids, but they're twins. So as a parent, it's hard to not compare. How are you doing in this grade? Especially when they have some of the same teachers. Um, so students are very different, right? Even coming from the same parent, they're different, uh, but certainly from all across the state of Tennessee, all across this room, they're very different. Um, you know, we heard a little bit about um, public comment, and I heard somebody talk about Clarksville, and I live here in Hendersonville. Um, I do think the parent in public access to speak at meetings needs to be addressed, whether it's addressed through this or other measures. Uh, people need to, to be able to go and speak and advocate for their son or daughter at school board meetings without the concern of repercussions or without here in Sumner County making sure that the thing they want to talk about is on the agenda. So here in Sumner County, you can't talk at a public board meeting if it's not on the agenda already. So if I want to advocate for something that happened at school, well, if that item is not on the agenda, I can't give public comment. I think that's a disservice to the parents and the students. Um, we've heard a lot about school choice. We've heard a lot about funding following the students. And I think to be student focused, it has to follow the student, otherwise it's not student focused because what's right for my two kids is not the same that's right for every other person's kids in here. We heard about values, the Tennessee values. Well, not everybody has the exact same values, so I as a parent need to decide what's right for, for my kids, and maybe it's not the same for both of them, but the funding does need to follow the student. And it's public funding, not a public school. The funding dollars are coming from the taxpayers. That's what's making it public, not the entity. And competition makes us all better. When we look at like FedEx and UPS, FedEx makes UPS be better if UPS wants to continue to thrive. And UPS makes FedEx better. So we need to not look at this as competition and try and close it up and, and guard our K through 12 schools and, and protect it from, you know, oh, 
uh, school choice and vouchers and private schools. We need to control it like it's in a perfect bubble. It's the competition that makes us all better as people. So we need to be open to that with school choice and, and letting the money follow the student. The public funding following the student is the only way you're gonna get the student success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Napolitano. All right, we are going to hear now from Ms. Marilyn Caperton. The next person on the list is John Little. So John, if you would raise your hand, John Little, we will run a mic down here to you. Uh, Ms. Caperton, please go ahead and get started. I am a retired public educator uh, of 40 years plus. And of course, since 1974, education has changed a lot. But there's still some basic things that are important. Um, the social changes have depth. Our, our country is not the same. And our society is not the same as when we started. Um, we have an extreme need for help with school counselors in the building because our children are in need of a lot of support with um, uh, social skills, social skills, not just uh, how to get along with each other, but uh, to give them coping skills in the, you know, the homes that they live in. School counseling addresses academics, uh, emotional skills, and um, work and future uh, employment skills. Our children are living at a time where there's a lot of abuse and a lot of neglect, and they need, uh, we need to keep the ratio for the, the school counselor's education, which has never been uh, used uh, in elementary, it should be one to 350. The first year I taught uh, as a school counselor, I was the only one and it was one to 800. And um, I've never had less than 500 kids. Um, the, um, we need, um, children need to play. It shouldn't be all just academics. Through play, they learn to cooperate, how to voice their opinion, and it, you know, also there are different learning styles. The gentleman was talking about the twins. We need to uh, understand that there are three learning styles, uh, visual, um, visual hearing, and hands-on. Some of my students that had the hardest times were hands-on students. They've also turned out to be some of the most successful students that I ever had. I've had some children with high IQs that straight A's and everybody thought they were smartest kids in the class. Many have done well, but many have failed, to, you know, because uh, they weren't challenged emotionally. We need mental health counselors in our schools because these are serious problems. If I shared with you a story that one of my school counselor's friends told me, she just needed somebody to talk to. It was horrendous what this child had experienced over spring, spring break. We need mental health people to assist them and they need to be able to listen and accept all different be equally funded. Ms. Caperton, thank you so much for your comments. We are going to hear now uh, from John Little, who's up here in the front kind of behind me. Our next speaker is gonna be David Wilson. David, if you would raise your hand. Uh, David Wilson. Oh, that's you, okay, great. <laughs> we'll come to you next. All right, uh, Mr. Little, please go ahead. Thank you, and my name is John Little, and I represent, I'm a natural propelled powerful parent leader, but I'm also on the Metro National Public School Board. And I wanted to speak today because as a person who has grown up in Nashville in an urban school district, and as we talk about money, right, I get really jealous because as we talk about our Metro National Public School budget, it's $1.1 billion a year. And that's a lot of money, right? But it may not be enough. But the reason that I'm here advocating as we think about student outcomes, because in some communities in Nashville, you have low performing schools, which we call priority schools. Priority schools are the bottom 5% schools in the entire state. And in Nashville, some kids go to a bottom 5% elementary school, 
a bottom 5% middle school, and a bottom 5% high school. And to me, that's criminal. It's criminal. And so my nephew, Malik, raise your hand. Hunter's Lane, my other nephew, David, raise your hand. Maplewood, my other niece, raise your hand. White's Creek. Once they graduated, it really was no opportunity. And so we have to do something different. And as we talk about funding school systems, we need to have outcomes. And so before that kid leaves high school, can they read? Can they write? Can they do arithmetic? Do they have financial literacy? Are they gonna be able to thrive? If all we're talking about is funding schools and funding public schools, we are wasting our time. And you can ask my nephew is gonna speak next. It did not benefit him to have a fully funded budget and him not be taught how to read or how to do math. And so I think we gotta open our minds and take a step back and say, let's not talk about buildings. Lord knows I care about teachers, but let's not talk about teachers. Let's talk about the students that we created, the buildings and the teachers for. How are we affecting their change? If we're not doing that, we need to rethink it. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Mr. Little. We are gonna hear from David Wilson next. Our following speaker will be Jason Freeman. So Jason, would you please raise your hand? Oh, there you are. We'll get a microphone around to you. Mr. Wilson, please go ahead. All right, my name is David Wilson. I graduated from Maplewood High School in 2013. And I'm just gonna pick it back on my, what my uncle said. I really think with $1.1 billion that we should be taught financial literacy. So instead, of, some certain people are not made for college, but if I have financial literacy, that means that I can go and build up my credit. So then I can get a loan from the bank. And if I like to create shoes, I like to make food or whatever it is, I can start my own business. So I just want to add it on to that. And I wanted y'all to really have that on y'all mind, financial literacy. Thank you so much, Mr. Wilson. Next up is going to be Jason uh, Freeman. Our next speaker will be Ms. Evelyn Hoyt. Evelyn, if you would raise your hand. I see you back there. We will run a microphone to you. Mr. Freeman, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to talk today about support staff in our schools and supporting those support staff. Um, I am with uh, SEIU Local 205. We represent support staff at Davidson County and, and the Shelby County Schools. Um, our union members have been fighting for $15 minimum wage for everyone in this country, but we've achieved it uh, in our school systems. But I want to tell you what that actually means for a support staff person who works 7.5 hours a day for 201 days a year. Uh, that means with, even at $15 an hour starting out, they make $22,612. $22,612 spread out over 21 paychecks comes out to $1,076 before taxes and before insurance for two weeks. What that means is you're taking home about $1,600 a month. The average rent in Nashville right now is $1,750 a month. I'm gonna say that again, $1,600 take home pay for a starting support staff person in a city that costs $1,750 for rent. Uh, we can't solve what's happening at, for education outcomes if we don't address what's happening outside of our school system, which is systemic poverty. There's over a million people in this state living in poverty, and our school system is keeping a lot of those people in poverty with the way that we set up our employment. So I just want to challenge our state to think about supporting support staff with the funding formula um, as you go forward. Thank you so much, Mr. Freeman. Next up is Evelyn Hoyt. Our following speaker will be Ms. Vanessa Sheehan. So Vanessa, if you would raise your hand. Vanessa, I think I see you back there. We will get a microphone to you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mrs. Hoyt, please go ahead. Hi. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you for doing this tonight. Um, my name is, is Evelyn Hoyt, Lynn Hoyt. I am a Metro National parent. Um, and I, I just want to do a lot of echoing around what a lot of folks have mentioned tonight in hopes that we are heard. Um, I do want to go back to say that public dollars should be used for public schools. Um, held accountable to our voters, um, held accountable by school districts. Um, no vouchers. Let's go down the list. Fund nurses at the national level. Fund counselors at the national level. Increase funding to address students that are behind. Increase funding to uh, address teacher compensation because our teacher shortage is real. 
We need funding for technology that is modern. We need funding to help with behavior and student pa and parent engagement. I agree with Sonia. Let's, let's, let's have a community site level steering to guide that funding at the school level and the student level. We want the best schools in Tennessee, not the worst, not the lowest. You don't provide the best with less. I want to ask, will you add to the education budget? Because it does not matter what formula we use when we uh, divide inadequate funds. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Hoyt. We are going to move now to Ms. Vanessa Sheehan. I think she's got a microphone. You are ready. Our next speaker is going to be Mr. Kent Foreman. Kent, if you could raise your hand. Kent, I see you. We will get you a mic, sir. Uh, Ms. Sheehan, please go ahead. Uh, good evening. I'm here on uh, behalf of the League of Women Voters of Hendersonville. We have been very uh, deeply involved um, in education as part of our even national program. And I'm here with um, our two co-presidents, Norma Dan and Shelley, what's your last name again? Is it Ames? <laughs> Shelley Ames, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, there are also other members of the league here, many of whom, oh sorry, many of whom are current or former educators or school administrators and otherwise involved in the field of education. Personally, I practiced school law and represented school boards for 38 years before I retired. So we, we have a, a real click here in terms of our interest and experience in education. Um, we propose just to make a few remarks, brief remarks, and we have uh, supported those remarks with a paperwork that we have passed on. Hopefully it will reach the commissioner. Uh, but here we go. State and local leagues in Tennessee have, for decades, identified various inequities in the Tennessee educational system, um, particularly with respect to funding. We have given uh, governor and the legislature uh, an extract from the Education Trust's Advocacy Guide, um, but I want to zero in on the crucial issue of expenditure, expenditures per student in Tennessee as compared with the rest of the country. Uh, the national average per student expenditure in 2019-2020 based on fall enrollment. This can also be done, by the way, uh, uh, based upon um, <coughs> actual attendance. <coughs> but in any event, um, in the same year when the federal was, the federal national average was $13,597. It was $9,978 in Tennessee which made Tennessee number 45 out of 50 states. In other words, as least amount expended. Um, we have supported these comments with a research study from the NEA, which is the National Education Association, for those who don't know what NEA means. They did a, a very extensive study in April of 2021, so it's quite current. Um, now, in this context of the expenditure per student, a, a Berkeley economist, and you're going to wonder, why am I talking about an economist, um, named David, along with two of his colleagues, two weeks ago, won the Nobel Prize in economics. Their research uh, was based on whether school quality and school resources that labor market outcomes. That means success in school and your ability to get a decent job. Like the young man alluded to that. Anyway, um, one researcher concluded that students who attended schools that received more money after court-ordered financial reform earned more money as adults than students who attended the same schools just before the new money came through. So same schools but uh, 
after court action, more money, much better achievement. Ms. Sheehan, I will thank you for your comments. I want to make sure that we're fair and keeping everyone with the same amount of time. I can assure you that your document oh. will make it to the commission. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Sorry, I'm finished. I just wanted to make sure that... Um, no, I appreciate it yeah. very much, and I okay. appreciate you being here. I also think we are wearing our microphones out, which is a good problem to have because we want to hear from all of you. So we might um, uh, try to make do with one of those hand, uh, the wireless microphones. So just bear with us a little bit on the technology, folks, but I appreciate each and every one of you. Mr. Kent Foreman, you are up next. I think you've got a microphone and are ready to go. Our next speaker will be Chris Gregory. So Mr. Gregory, Ms. Gregory, Chris, if you would raise your hand. Okay, I don't see that person. I don't see that person here. Let me uh, let me see if I can identify the next speaker. It's Audra Bridgman. Is Audra here? Audra, I see you. We will come to you next. All right, Mr. Foreman, please go ahead. Okay, I'm Kent Foreman. I'm a resident of Williamson County, but I've been involved with Metro Nashville Public Schools for about 15 years in a in a volunteer capacity. Uh, I echo so many of the comments that have already been made. I just wanted to emphasize one that the pie that we're talking about is just not big enough. We can move the deck chairs around on this exi existing pie, but we're not going to accomplish what we need to for our students. So the pie needs to be bigger, more funding. We're spending $77 a day for imprisoned people and $53 a day for our students in public education. <laughs> and and the current funding does not cover some critical areas like uh, it's, it's already been mentioned technology for every classroom enough teachers from a ratio perspective for every classroom uh, enhanced studies for ap courses in foreign language and physical education doesn't cover the expense for mental and and uh, mental health it doesn't cover professional development for teachers and the ratio for, it's already been mentioned, the ratio for social workers and counselors is just not sufficient. It's way low compared to the national average. So to me, it's all about the amount of funding. It's not so much the allocation of funding. Another statistic is that the state spends 2.9% of all taxable resources on education. That's the lowest in the country. Thank you so much, Mr. Foreman. Uh, next speaker, Audra Bridgman. Uh, I think you've got the mic, so we'll see if that one works out all right. I think it'll be great. Our next speaker is going to be Teresa Bradley. So, Teresa, if you could raise your hand. Okay, I see you here. We will get a mic down to you. Uh, Ms. Bridgman, please go ahead. Uh, hi. My name is Audra Bridgman. I'm a former teacher, and I'm a current homeschool parent in Robertson County. And I'd like to put forth a few comments on behalf of a very large and rapidly growing homeschool community. I think right now Robertson County has about two to 3,000 homeschoolers and the public school population is around 13,000. So that's a significant portion of the students in our county. Um, I support all the educators and all the methods. I mean, I've done the teaching scene before. So I know you guys are working hard and I appreciate everything everyone's doing. Um, but for a wide variety of reasons, people have chosen to homeschool and I, they're not going to as far as I know, they're not gonna change that decision easily. Um, so I'm on here on behalf of them to support the issues that they go through um, with teaching their children. A lot of these families, homeschool families, have had to switch to one income and they're purchasing everything out of their own pocket. So things that other students would get, curriculum and computers, field trips, at the all the other basic supplies, they're purchasing those out of pocket. And honestly, a lot of homeschool families don't have the money to afford all of that, so they just do without. So a lot of times you see them competing for free resources at the library because they can't afford a full uh, high quality curriculum. Um, I have another angle to this that I own a small business where I provide educational supplies to students and families and schools and museums, different places. And I've seen over the past five years of this business that many states across our country offer funding directly to families. And so I have a lot of parents come to me and tell me about their state funded programs, that they're purchasing their supplies and they'll be reimbursed by the state. Um, and that varies widely on how they implement those programs. Some of them, the parents submit receipts 
to the state to get approval for the purchase, whether that's a tutoring program uh, or direct supplies for curriculum. Uh, some of them have a, a vendor set up where as a business I can apply to be a vendor and if I'm approved through that state, then the parents can go straight to the website and purchase directly. So that's another option. I don't know how feasible that is for Tennessee. Obviously there are a lot of funding issues. Um, but that is something that I see a lot of families going without, and I think that we could support them for really not a whole lot. I mean, it, I know it takes a lot more to fund a student to go through a public school than, you know, a thousand bucks for a homeschool student's good curriculum. So those are my comments. Thanks Thank for you so much for your comments, Ms. Bridgman. We appreciate those. Uh, next up, we have Teresa Bradley, our following speaker. Y'all, we are round and home base here with the folks who said they wanted to speak. Camden Dowell will be the next speaker. Camden, if you could raise your hand. Camden Dowell. Okay. Uh, let's see if uh, Ms. Liza Ramage. Liza, oh, are you Camden? Do I see your hand? Carleen Dow, I apologize. We are going to come to you next. So we are going to get a microphone over to you. Ms. Bradley, please go ahead and get started. Hi. Um, I am a parent in Tennessee, but I'm also an employee of Metro Nashville Public Schools, as is my colleague, Susan Clayton. Um, but tonight we're here representing on, on behalf of our state organization, the Tennessee Association of School Psychologists. Nobody has talked about psychologists tonight. Uh, we hear about counselors, we hear about, you know, social workers and all the people that deal with mental health. But we are really, we are comprehensively trained to address academic, behavioral, social, emotional needs of the student, the whole student and the family. So in our national recommendation, we're supposed to have one to 500 per, like, psychologist to student. Um, the national average is actually 1 to 1,380-something. In Tennessee, our average is 1 to almost 1,900 students. There are some districts that have no actual like, employed, full-time employed school psychologists. There's actually 34 that have three or less. There are some districts that serve more than 3,000 students per school psychologist. Um, we are, we are fortunate in Metro Nashville that we are around one to a thousand. Um, but we would like for the state to address, the, the, we are student focused in everything that we do. So what we would really like to see is to have more funding for school psychologists in our schools, to have one in each school if possible, because we can do a whole lot of stuff that people don't even realize that we're there. We kind of operate in the shadows a little bit. But we're there doing things for the kids every single day. So we would love it if we could get more funding to attract people to Tennessee because we aren't paid very well in Tennessee and we have a whole national shortage of school psychologists to begin with. So if we could put more funding into the budget for that, it would be great for our students. It would help tremendously. Thank you so much, Ms. Bradley. We'll hear from Carlene Dow. Did I get it right? Okay, good. Um, next up, it will be Liza Ramage. Liza, I see your hand. We will get a microphone to you. Ms. Dow, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm a, a product of the public schools myself, and I was uh, inspired to be a teacher myself, and I was a special education teacher here in Sumner County for 30 years. Um, my daughters uh, both came up in the public schools, and I am a firm believer in the public school system. Uh, I saw that um, the needs of the most needy were not being met. Uh, we need to have, number one, more, more funding. 46th in the nation is not good enough for our students. We also need to meet the needs of the most needy, um, the people who are living in poverty, the people who are learning English uh, as a second language, and the students with special needs. This is our responsibility as American citizens to educate all of our children and to make the world more equitable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Dow. 
Next up, we're going to hear from Liza Ramage. Uh, the, the following speaker will be our last speaker from the night. That will be Miss Martha Wedeman. Martha, if you raise your hand, I see you. We will hand that mic down to you. Um, Miss Ramage, please go ahead. Thank you. I'm glad to be here tonight. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm a retired public school educator, and my children and grandchildren have all attended public school. Um, in Tennessee, 75% of our children attend public schools. And I think I can speak for many of us when I say that we want our public school kids' education to be in the top 5% of the country instead of in the bottom 5%. Um, I want every student every kid in Tennessee to feel welcome in his or her school and to be able to perform on or above grade level. At the moment, we are not close to this goal, but this is an achievable goal. Many of the things that people have already mentioned contributed to, contribute to this goal. Um, the nurses and the counselors and the psychologists and the social workers are important for our kids' mental and physical health needs. But we need, fund, we need to fund programming, special programming, for kids who are behind, for kids who are low income or English learners or students with disabilities. It is important that we have funding to make our schools the best. We can do this. It will require more funding. But happily, here in Tennessee, we are able to fund our schools better than we are currently doing. Tennessee has lots of dollars that can be focused toward education and toward our goal of having our schools in Tennessee be some of the best in the nation. In that way, we can choose to support and prioritize our children who are our future. Thank you. Ms. Ramage, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, next speaker we have is uh, Ms. Wedeman, who is right there. Scott, you see the, uh, she's got a really pretty red blazer on. Ms. Wedeman, right kind of in the middle of the auditorium. We'll pass that microphone down to you, ma'am. And please go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Martha Wedeman, and I live in Cheatham County. And I have several concerns about school funding. One is we need, as everyone, a lot of people have said, we need more funding in our public schools in general. So we have per pupil expenditures that are lower than Kentucky. Tennessee is 45 out of 50 states and per, pu per pupil expenditures. Cheatham County is 143 out of 147 school districts in the state and expenditures per pupil. But any plan that reallocates existing funds without adding hundreds of millions of more dollars in our, into our public schools across the state is a non-starter. If we can allocate $900 million for a new manufacturing plant in West Tennessee, which is a good idea, we should at least be able to add 500 million or more to our public education budgets in the state. I would favor a dollar at least to be added to our public primary education funds for every dollar spent on business incentives in the state. A plan that allocate, advocates for funding following the student could promote more charter schools and drain money away from our public schools, which already are some of the lowest funded schools in the country. So I'm opposed to this plan. Pandemic aside, Cheatham County is at crisis levels in our lack of math achievement. The high school nearest me, which is Sycamore, has only eight, eight, not 80, 8% 8 of the students testing on grade level for math. Our administrators tell us that it's very difficult for us to hire and retain good math teachers in the county. The state needs to provide strong incentives for young adults to enter the teaching profession in math and computer science, and we need strong incentives for math teachers to be retained in school districts across the state, as well as provide math tutors for students who are so far behind. 
Early childhood education is the foundation for successful completion of high school and college, as well as achieving stable employment, studies show. All students need access to early childhood education with social supports for students and families. Also, the community school concept, which adds staff to local uh, schools and strengthens resources for schools and families, is an excellent model. I know we have several of those schools in Nashville. Students must have adequate food, shelter, and clothing, and medical care to be successful. This model needs to be expanded to lower income urban and rural schools, and integrated social services need to be provided. We've also had two deaths in Cheatham County of teachers due to COVID. So to reduce staff, parent, and student deaths, schools should encourage everyone to be vaccinated. Ms. Wedevin, thank you so much for your comments. Appreciate that a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank each and every one of you who had an opportunity to share tonight. We know that we could talk way longer from each of you to hear your specific perspective, your specific stories. I want to invite you all to submit your comment to us in writing, if you so choose. There is an email address when you signed in, when you came in, tnedu.funding at tn.gov. I'll say that again, tnedu dot funding at tn.gov. We really want you to submit your comments, have your voice heard. Please send us an email so that we can uh, include these comments in the, in the discussion. Make sure that all the folks who need to hear from you can. Thank you again, and I will turn it over to Commissioner Schwinn for some closing comments. Thank you all. As fast as I can keep my voice, um, which I think I might do, because this, is this work? Oh, it's working, of course. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. I think uh, one of the most special moments for me was actually people who had prepared comments and then change what they were gonna say because of the things that have been said in the room. That's part of what we know has to be a, a good evolving conversation. It's about saying, seeing what our perspective is, seeing what the perspectives of others might be, and then figuring out what is going to make the most sense for the most people here in Tennessee as it relates to our students. What has been, um, I'll be honest, it's, uh, this is our first one, and so taking a step back and seeing how many families, how many children and students, how many of our district and uh, employees and staff and team members are here and members of the community who just care deeply about this issue. Um, the fact that you are here on a Wednesday night with us having this conversation uh, is really important to me and actually deeply impactful. I will be reading a lot of your comments. Um, that, is, that is thousands of pages and I actually can't wait uh, because what it is and what I have heard tonight is that you all care a lot about kids. And the shared value that I think I heard in this room is that we want Tennessee to be the highest performing, best state in the country for our children to get the best possible education. That is a value that we have all been talking about tonight. I wanna make sure that when we are building and thinking about building a new formula, when we talk about a student-based funding formula, and I just wanna say that's a little different than Money Follows the Student, heard that feedback tonight, um, but a student-based funding formula where we are building a funding model based on the individual needs of every single child and what is gonna help them to be successful and to thrive. What I'm hearing is that we have got to prioritize the needs of students. Um, thank you very much for everything that you've said tonight. Um, we do have this recorded. I wanna also just encourage you, continue to send your comments in writing. Um, as this conversation evolves, you hear more things, you have more ideas. There is no limit to the number of emails that you can send. Um, and I know my team's like, thank you for saying that, but I'm gonna say it again. There is no limit to the number of emails you can send um, because this matters. Um, there, was a, there was a parent who said it best, we wanna look five years down the road and design what we want to be true for public education in this state. And we have to figure out what that means today and over the next three months so that when we look back in five years and we look back to this moment, to tonight, to the three months that will follow, we can say we accomplished our goal to set our entire state on a path where every child has a chance and every child can be successful. I'm so deeply grateful for you showing up tonight. Please continue to be engaged and involved um, and just very, very appreciative of the time and what's ahead. And I have, I think we are gonna be bold here in Tennessee and do what's right for kids because that's what needs to be done. So thank you very much, appreciate it.